it is am amazing to me to think that um, just 10 years ago, or 10 to 12 years ago, we had the approval by the FDA of the two first generation EGFR TKIs, Jafitnib and Erlotinib. Now, Jafitnib eventually went away, um, and we won't talk about that whole issue, but Erlotinib has remained kind of the standard first generation drugs. We then saw the development um, of a couple second generation drugs. A fatinib is a second generation drug, and this is um, different from the first generation in that it's an irreversible inhibitor, and it's a pan-her inhibitor. Um, uh, there's another drug uh, that has not yet uh, been approved, dacomitinib, which is another second generation drug, very similar to a fatinib, but a different de developmental course. Um, that's not yet been successful in terms of leading to FDA approval. We are now in the era of the third generation drugs and the difference uh, with regard to the third generation drugs is that they uh, are more specific for mutant EGFR in relatively spare wild type EGFR where that is not true of the first and second generation. Um, it, agents which will inhibit mutant EGFR but also will inhibit wild type and may account for uh, the typical tax toxicities of rash and diarrhea. The um, third generation agents were also developed with an intent to um, be active against the major secondary mutation for resistance that we see in exon 20, the so-called T790M mutation, which occurs in about 50 to 60 percent of patients with known EGFR mutations after exposure to first, second uh, generation TKIs. So it's a major issue with regard to the mechanism of resistance, and so uh, as a target, it, it is of high priority. And that's where rosalitinib and AZD9291 come in. Those are the two lead third generation compounds, which we saw some very exciting data at, at ASCO this year. Um, and uh, both of them have been evaluated both in T790M negative and positive. We focused on the T790M positive population because the, the level of activity in that population is quite remarkable. Uh, remember, these are patients who have typically been on uh, a first or second generation TKI and then at the time of progression transition to that. And response rates are, are north of 50% of PFS is, you know, a, a around a year or, or greater in this setting. Um, and um, the, the majority of that benefit is seen in the T790M positive population. Now, I will point out that these drugs also seem to have a lower level of activity in T, the T790M negative population. So, uh, I don't think we should necessarily throw them out in the negative population, but the current development is really focusing on T790M positive uh, patients. Getting back to the relative selectivity to mutant EGFR, there has been less typical skin and GI toxicity associated with these sorts of agents, um, uh, which, is, which is a management advantage, actually. Um, a couple of unique toxicities with regard to rosalitinib, there's about a 20% rate of grade three hyperglycemia which was not anticipated from the mouse um, uh, preclinical data. Um, there is a metabolite that seems to inhibit the insulin receptor that may be responsible for this. Um, having known that from the early experience, um, uh, there's been a developmental strategy to deal with that. So in the early institution of metformin uh, has largely been a, a successful strategy, and I don't see the hyperglycemia as necessarily a deal breaker in this setting, given the relative level of activity. Now, interestingly, AZD9291, um, we've not seen any hyperglycemia with that agent. Um, there's been a low level of uh, QTC issues with, with both drugs, a very low level of ILD-like reactions with, two, with, with, with both a agents. So, you know, again, a, a pretty impressive level of activity in a relatively impressive lack of significant toxicity with these agents, kind of the best of both worlds. So I think, you know, the possibilities that we have moving forward in the EGFR mutant population, particularly those patients that develop T790M, I think we are at a point where, you know, it, it might be realistic that a patient 
is on a drug like erlotinib for one or two or more years, develops T790M and may be on a third generation drug for one or two or three years. Uh, before you know it, you got a real chronic disease and, and patients haven't yet made it to IV chemotherapy. Um, so it's very exciting in this subset of patients that we will be developing these agents that, that um, uh, seem to do better. We alluded to the Cato data before, so maybe combining bevacizumab. We don't know how that may change the resistance mechanisms and stuff like this. Uh, perhaps that will give us some, some um, uh, uh, additional advantage in terms of that. Um, there's interest in combining some of the uh, 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 immunotherapies with targeted agents. So um, in these subsets of molecularly defined populations, uh, it's, it's, it's very exciting uh, uh, thinking about the possibilities of uh, making this into a much more chronic disease than we been, been have you know, been used to in this setting. The only disappointing thing is that they're a minority of our patients. And so we're still having to deal with the kind of pan wild type, if you will, patients in which you know, we struggle with the issues we talked about in terms of optimizing chemo and first, second, third line sorts of treatments. Um, hopefully we'll be finding you know, ac more actionable uh, molecular subsets to direct our therapies in, 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 in more patients. Given the level of activity of the third generation compounds, there's great interest in integrating them as first line therapy. And, and might they be better than first or second uh, line uh, drugs? Might they be better used sequentially? There are some trials addressing um, their use in previously treated patients relative to chemotherapy. Right now, our standard of care um, outside of a clinical trial and before FDA approval of the third uh, generation agents is to transition them to chemotherapy. So there are some trials looking at uh, these third generation compounds relative to chemotherapy. Um, so lots of questions to ask. And, and, and again, this, you know, again, we're in a setting where we might have the ability to effectively treat these patients with different types of treatment over time, hopefully more than less, um, where you can kind of keep the disease at a subclinical state. The patient has a very good quality of life. I, I don't know if we can start talking about cures with these strategies, but as I point out to many of my patients who are relatively asymptomatic and fully functional, if I can keep your cancer from getting any worse than it is now, your quality of life is pretty good and you're doing well. And so the, the art is not, may, may not necessarily be to actively eradicate the tumor, but to arrest the tumor uh, where it can't bring on clinical symptoms and, and all the things that cancers do, metastatic disease, other complications, those sorts of things. So, so that's, that's the, an area that, that's quite exciting given the development of all of these new agents.